Today's session is on Changing the Game, the Psychology of High Performance, delivered by John O'Sullivan of the Changing the Game Project. John is the author of the best-selling book, Changing the Game, The Parent's Guide to Raising Happy, High-Performing Athletes and Giving Youth Sports Back to Our Kids. John is a former college and professional player and spent nearly two decades coaching on the youth, high school and collegiate levels. From 2006 to 2012, he was the technical director of Oregon Rush Soccer Club and has recently worked as a Central Oregon Regional Training Center Director for the Portland Timbers. He has a USSF A license, an NSCAA Advanced National Diploma, and he now travels and speaks full-time to schools and sports clubs across the United States, educating parents and coaches on performance and creating a positive sporting culture in their club. Welcome to the presentation, John. Thanks, David. All right. Well, thank you guys all for, for being on tonight. And I just want to start by saying I'm not a psychologist. I am a coach just like you and spent 20 years coaching youth, high school, college, club, all that stuff. I was a technical director. I was a director of coaching. But a couple of years ago, I decided that I just really wanted to help parents and help coaches and help coaches teach parents what makes their players play at their top level? And when I started this journey, it was triggered by watching a kids game, a U10 boys game, where each team had three coaches yelling and screaming from the sidelines, and the parents are yelling from the sidelines, and the kids aren't happy, and they're not having fun. And all I was thinking was, wow, who's running this club? And then I realized that that was me. And then I needed to come up with some sort of education program that helped the parents and helped the coach to create the right atmosphere for the kids to play well. And as I researched my book and I started meeting and speaking with top educators and psychologists, what I found was the single greatest factor that affects our kids' performance is really their state of mind and their positive state of mind when they step on the field. And that all the things that affected this positive state of mind, they weren't things that I was learning in coaching schools. We talked about 10 different ways to play 5v2 and the tactics and all these exercises, but we weren't really getting down to what makes your players tick and why is one coach better than another coach in terms of getting things out of their players. And so that's what we're going to talk about here for about the next 25 minutes or so is some of the factors that we fight against as coaches to create a great state of mind in our kids and then what can we do as coaches and many of us are parents as well to really give them a great sports experience and allow them to play up to their potential. So the first thing that I really want to talk about here is three main sports myths that we're all facing as coaches and as parents. Because these three main myths are, are really the driving force behind youth sports and youth soccer in our country today. Now, the first one, this idea that early specialization is needed, you need to pick a sport at eight years old if you're going to get to an elite level, is a really massive one, and that's the, sort of the foundational one. If I had any question that this was a hot-button topic, I wrote about it on, on my blog, The Changing the Game Project, uh, two weeks ago, and I think it's had 40,000 comments and shares and likes and all that, so this is a, a massive, massive topic. And the thing about early specialization and the myth is that well, you have to pick this sport right away. And what the science actually says is that what early specialization leads to is a higher injury rate, a higher burnout rate, and a lot of stress and psychological problems for kids. And they actually have studies that show that early specialization children often become inactive adults who give up sports altogether. But as coaches and as parents, we feel this pressure that if I don't get my kid in the program, if I don't get my, my son on the best team, my daughter on the best team when they're really young, what happens is we're going to miss our window. And we get funneled out of the great coaching. We get funneled out of the right development system. And so we have to specialize now. And that's why I think a lot of kids are specializing so early that we have three out of four of them are dropping out of sports when they hit middle school. So what this feeds is 
to the second myth that we all struggle with is that high performers focus on winning. Right? Because I've specialized early, I need to get my kid on the best team, the team that wins all its games. And if we've all coached long enough, we've coached the team that went 10-1 and and lost our best player to the team that went 11-0 and and beat us because people are so focused on that the only measure of development is winning. Well, as we know in soccer, we have this golden age of skill development where we really have to teach our kids to play. And, and by learning to play, they're going to make mistakes and they're going to lose games because you're trying to play out of the back because you're not letting your, your goalkeeper pump the ball, you're making him or her put it down and throw it or roll it out and play with their feet. And so because high performers don't focus on winning, they focus on the process of getting better. They focus on what we call excellence instead of success. So are, we have too many parents focused on winning too many, and, and not focused on the process of getting better. And what these two myths finally feed into is if I specialize early, and I get on the best team, the winning team that helps me get to the top tournament, then my kid's going to get a scholarship. And as we know, there's some studies that show 30 to 50 percent of parents think their kid's going to get a scholarship, while only one to two percent of high school athletes actually get one. And beyond that, there are most of those are even partial scholarships. They're ten or eleven thousand dollar is the average scholarship amount. So all the thousands of dollars of investment, years of investment, leads to a very small payback. So we as coaches and we as parents face these myths every day. And what they have done is they've really brought all these adult values onto the youth sports environment. And these are what we have to overcome. So this is what we're going to talk about for the next while here. So basically, what we're oh, there's the great. So. So basically, I love this quote. This is Timothy Galway. Timothy Galway wrote a book about three decades ago called The Inner Game of Tennis. And this is what he says, performance equals potential minus interference. How our kids play on any given day is their potential. And what is their potential? That's their genetics and the training they've done, the coaching they have, the, the, the amount of practice they put in, minus the things that interfere with that. And what are the things that interfere? Really, the biggest things are a bad state of mind, a bad psychological approach to playing. Now, when I was a young coach, I used to think that my job was to pile all this great information upon my players. And what I started realizing later on, especially once I started doing the work on this book, was the best thing I could do was strip away things. The more I could take off the players when it came time for a game, the better that they would play. So their potential shows through when we remove interference. And I think what we have to ask ourselves as coaches and as parents is, are we interfering with our players? When you think about it, players make about two conscious decisions per second during a game. They, do I step? Do I drop? Do I move in? Do I move out? Do I dribble? Do I pass? Do I cross? Do I shoot? And as coaches, how much are we going to add on top of that by shouting out instructions? How much are parents going to add on top of that by shouting out instructions from the sideline. And what happens, as we all know, is the more instructions that get yelled in, the more coaching from us, the more coaching from parents, less players do, the worse they play. Now, when I do live events, one of my favorite things to do is I'll bring some parents up on stage, and I'll get one of them to stand there with some M&Ms and throw them up in the air and try to catch them in their mouth. And then I'll get some other parents to yell instructions at them. And what inevitably happens is, after catching a couple of M&Ms, one will ricochet off a dad or a mom's tooth into the crowd, and everyone laughs. And I say, well, why'd you drop that M&M? It's like, because I started listening to what everyone was saying, and I stopped paying attention to what I was doing. So when we train our players, we train them by repetitive practice to use what we call bottom-up thinking. Use a part of the brain that we make things have it. So for those of us who have played soccer long enough, when we're going to pass the ball, we're not sitting there consciously thinking about lock my ankle, toe up, heel down, bend my knee. We just do it. And then we use the conscious decision-making to be creative. Do I play against the green here? Do I cut the other way? Do I turn? Do I take a shot when no one's expecting it? But if we're flooding that conscious decision-making with, with 
instruction after instruction after instruction starts to interfere with this bottom-up thinking. And they start thinking about their technique instead of just doing their technique. So what we really have to do, I believe, as coaches is create an environment where we allow our players to make their decisions themselves and we allow the game to belong to them and then we use training to train all these things so that they become habits. So what one of the first things that's really, really important when we're trying to create the correct state of mind in our players is understanding what's called mindset. And Dr. Carol Dweck is a researcher from Stanford University. She wrote a great book by the same name, Mindset. And she spent 30 years studying motivation and studying performance. And what she's found in those 30 years is that people have one of two types of mindset uh, when it comes to any sort of achievement activity a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Now, fixed mindset individuals are very results-oriented. So if your child, if one of your players is fixed mindset, they might say, I failed my math test. I'm not good at math. I lost my starting spot on the soccer team. I'm just not good at soccer. For fixed mindset individuals, effort is really meaningless because you either are or you aren't. Your abilities are fixed. And this is really an average performing mindset as the research of Dweck. And what she's also found is that we have what's called growth mindset individuals. And growth mindset individuals are very process oriented and effort is everything. So a growth mindset individual might say, I failed my math test, I need to study more. I lost my starting spot on the soccer team, I need to practice more. And what they think is that everything can be learned and that what I am today as an athlete is, has nothing to do with I'll be a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, and that is determined by my effort, my application over the time. And this is a high-performing mindset. And what Dweck has found in her research is that mindsets are very malleable and you can change them. And one of the ways that many kids are instilled with a fixed mindset is through praise, bad praise. So when, as a parent and when as a coach, we praise ability when we say you're really smart or you're very talented or, or you're a great athlete, but we're not turning the focus onto their effort and onto their process of getting better. We're turning the focus onto their their fixed ability. But when we start to praise effort, her research demonstrates that results improve dramatically. Now as a coach, I used to have two different words for these growth and fixed mindset, I used to call fixed mindset individuals, I would consider them uncoachable. And the growth mindset, I'd say these are my coachable kids. And it was a very interesting thing because what was happening was not my coaching, it was how they were hearing my coaching. So if I made a correction to a growth mindset player and said, hey, instead of putting inside, open your hips and try to play the ball up the line, what they're hearing is the coach is trying to make me better. And a fixed mindset player would hear, well, I must not be good because coach has to coach me. And if I was actually a good player, I wouldn't need to be coached. And once I realized this in players, and once I realized that I just needed to talk to players differently, I found that my coaching was much more effective across a wider spectrum of players. So mindset is an incredibly important thing. If we want our kids to play their best, we have to instill this growth mindset. The next thing that we have to do is to think about why kids play sports and, and why kids quit sports. And there's a lot of academic studies done in this area, uh, University of Notre Dame, Michigan State, and they've been done all over the world, boys and girls, lots of different ages. And basically, when, when they ask kids, why do you sign up, why do you show up and play sports, their answers are to have fun and to be with their friends and to learn new things and to do things that they're good at and, and just to stay in shape and because they enjoy the excitement of competition. And one of the choices of the 20 things they can pick is winning, but it never comes in at the top. The uh, Michigan State study was done in the mid-90s, and for kids 12 and under, winning came in at number 13. And by the time they got to high school, it had jumped all the way to number 9. And I think it's a very interesting thing to think about as a, a coach when you show up to your field, most of your players have eight, ten things that are more important than winning that game. 
as a coach, I know for me there was not eight or ten things that were more important than winning the game. Then, so that's that adult value versus the kid's value. So we have to really think about why kids play. And by the same token, we have to think about why kids quit sports. And they quit because of criticism and yelling. They quit because they don't get to play because we're emphasizing the winning and bad communication. The big one is they're, they're afraid of making mistakes and they get bored and, and they're not learning. So today in the United States, we've got 70% of kids quitting sports by 13. And what that tells me is that there's a lot more of this, the why kids quit, than there is the why kids play. And so as coaches and as parents, we have to really instill this more of the why kids play into every practice and into every game. And we have to get rid of this criticism and yelling. We have to get rid of benching kids because we have to win this game. We want them to stick with the game. We want them to grow the sport in our country. Now, it was very interesting, not this past NSTA convention, but uh, a year ago, um, I saw Dr. Dan Trigang speak. And Dr. Dan is a sports psychologist for U.S. soccer, U.S. hockey, U.S. A team. And he was talking about this study, and what he said was he actually repeated it with some of his elite athletes in those sports. And the funny thing was that the results were exactly the same. And he asked the best young hockey players or soccer players, the national team did, well, why do you play? The answer was, because it's fun. I don't, you know, I don't work soccer, I, I play soccer. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind when you present these type of statistics to parents, they say, well, those are recreational kids. My kid's an ODP player, my kid's an academy player, my, my kid's a national team player. Well, they still have to love the game. They still have to enjoy themselves. They still have, it has to, the experience has to belong to them. They're going to get out there day after day and do the work to become really, really good. So, and, and just so you know, if, if you have a question along the way here, type it into the box, as David said and we'll try to get to those at the end. I know I'm going through a lot of this very fast. But anyway, so we know how we create this high-performing mindset in our, in our kids. And there's a couple things that we can do as coaches, there's a couple things that we can do as parents, and there's a couple things that as coaches we can do and we can teach our parents to do this. And the first one that I think is really important is give your kids control and ownership of their experience. And the best way to do this is, is to set goals with them and, and push them towards their goals. Now, athletes that have control, athletes that have ownership over their experience, they play longer, they play harder, they play with more enjoyment, that they lead, they drive the car, and you're just a passenger as an adult instead of you being the one always driving them. Now, when I was a, when I was a young coach, I used to do goal setting. And I would look at my team, and I would lay out my team and say, okay, this is, this is what we're going to do this year. And then I would yell and scream and push and prod them towards my goals. And what inevitably happened was we never achieved my goals. And I would get angrier and angrier, and the experience wasn't good for them, and it wasn't good for me. And then one day I had a 16-year-old boy say, coach, you don't think we can win the league. You're the only one who thinks we can win the league. We're not that good. And that was sort of a defining moment for me to say, well, wait a second, I need to know what the kids think here. And so from that day on, I started a process which has worked very well for a long time. And what I do is realizing that we have to get everyone on the same page, the coaches, the parents, and the players on the same page. So every year before the season, I sit down my team and I do goal setting. What are your three individual goals? What are three goals for the team? And I ask the parents to do the same thing. What are three goals for your son or your daughter? What are three, your three goals for the team? And I make them take those goals home, sit down at the kitchen table that night, and compare their goals. And what I tell parents is this. You have to accept your kids' goals for playing sports. Because if you don't, that abyss will swallow your relationship with your kids. You want them to be college players or national team players, and they're just saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm having fun, I'm being with my friends, and I don't really want to do extra practice, that's going to cause tons of stress and, and tons of anxiety in 
your family. But what happens is when you do accept their goals, you can now push them because it's their goal. Now, as a coach, what I would do is once the parents and kids got on the same page, I would collect all the kids' goals. And what I'd say to them, I, I'd tally them all up and say, okay, here's what you want as a team. 100% effort of practice, better commitment. And we'd set some long-range goals. We want to win a state championship. We want to be a team that, you know, we want to win regionals or something like that. Whatever those were, I would tell them what their goals were, and then I would hold them accountable for what they asked for. And the best part about this was it totally changed the way that I coached because when the effort wasn't good at training and the commitment wasn't good, all I had to say was, stop. What are you, you know, you guys said you want to win regionals this year. You said you want to win the state championship. Do you think that your opponents are training like this? Do you think they only have 10 people at practice? Is this really what's going to take us to the next level? Now, we can all sit down and do more goals if you want, and they would inevitably say, no, no, coach, you're right, you're right. And nine times out of 10, practice stepped it up a few notches. The level was great. I never raised my voice. I never did anything because all I did was hold them accountable for what they asked me to do. They asked me to coach them up to this level. I pushed them a little bit farther. But by holding them accountable, and pushing them toward their goals and constantly reminding them of what they asked for, basically what I was saying to them is, if this is what you want to do, and you said you want to do it, you wrote this down, then I'm going to help you do it right. And as a parent, we do that same thing with our kids. This is your goal. You said you wanted to practice one extra time a week. Let's go. And we help them achieve their goals, and it becomes a much, much better process. Number two is, we have to allow our kids to fail. This is a big, big problem in our country these days because we've forgotten that the most successful people are, are the ones who fail the most. A Ronaldo, a Messi, a Gareth Bale, they're not the best free kick takers in the world because, because they only hit them in games. They hit them in practice over and over and they miss more than they make, but they've failed so many times that when it comes time to hit one in front of 100,000 people, chances are they're probably going to make it. And what's happened, especially in the United States, is we have a generation of, of, of parents who are preventing their kids from failing. And when you don't fail, you don't learn, and you don't get better. And they swoop in every time there's a difficult situation. Again, we're coaches, so we're tough on a kid. We bench them. We, we don't blame their favorite position. And what happens? Here comes the email. Here comes the phone call. Here comes the text. They go to our boss and they say, we need a new coach because so-and-so is hurting my kid's self-esteem. And we've forgotten how to let our kids fail. And because of this, we're, we're really in, in, in big trouble. And again, going back to why kids quit sports, because they're afraid of making mistakes. And when we have parents on the sideline yelling instructions, what they're really saying to their kids is, you cannot make a mistake, and, and this is too important for you to make a mistake, so I'm going to tell you how to do it right. So as coaches, it's really, really important that we create environments where our kids are encouraged to fail, are encouraged to try things and make, and, and, and make mistakes. They're encouraged when they get the, the ball at right back, and, and maybe they try to play a pass, and it ends up in the back of our net, and we say, that's okay. The idea was right. We'll get it right next time. And teams that play without fear of failure are the teams that play the best soccer because they're not afraid to play. So this is really important. Now, another note on this part is that parents need to let their kids fail on the ride home after games. We've all probably heard the thing that most kids say their worst sports memory is the ride home. And it is because that's the time a lot of parents choose to interrogate their kids and do all their critiquing and all their coaching. So as coaches, we have a ride home moment, which we might call our post-game talk. And if we spend a lot of time at a moment when emotions are high and we're physically and mentally exhausted, and where our emotions are hot, our players' emotions are hot, it's usually not a very productive time, especially after we've lost. And so I think, as coaches, if we take that post-game talk 
and shorten it to the bare, bare essentials, and then talk about it at the next practice. Or if you're at a weekend event, go for a little cool down jog that night and a stretch and talk about it then when emotions are better and people have eaten and they've got a smile back on their face. It's a very, very important thing to do if you really want to have teams that are continually progressing and moving forward. We have one more thing. And this is a really big one. I think that one of the single greatest factors that affect kids' performance is when they don't enjoy the experience, and most kids don't enjoy the experience because they feel like their parents or their coaches' love of them is tied to sports outcomes. When they think that if they lose, mom's not going to love me or dad's not going to love me, they play with fear and they just don't get any enjoyment out of the game at all. And so we have to create environments where kids enjoy the experience. Now, about 10 years ago, I met a man named Bruce Brown, and Bruce runs an organization called Proactive Coaching out here in the Northwest. And what he told me was that if you can teach your coaches and teach their parents to use five words Every time a kid steps off the athletic field, you will see a massive, massive difference in how they play. And the five words are very simple. I love watching you play. And I started telling my parents of my team, just say that after the game. Tell your kid you love watching them play. And in the beginning, what happens is they laugh at me and they say, you know, that's way too simple. That sounds, that sounds stupid. That's not going to work. And then inevitably, year after year, six months down the line, I'd get an email, I'd get a phone call saying, remember that thing you told me about loving and watching my kids play? This changed our life. It has changed our experience for the better. So as a coach, if you can pass that on to your parents and get them to say over and over to their kids, you know, I love watching you play. I'm just honored to be out here and see you trying your best you will see a massive difference in how your team plays and how they perform. They'll play without fear, they'll play with aggression, they'll play with courage, and they'll play with great enjoyment and freedom. So I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. So really to just finish up here and then we'll take some questions if you have any. What I'd like to say is this. We, we are the gatekeepers as, as coaches. And we're all quite aware of the direction that youth sports has gone in this country, and that three out of four kids are quitting by the age of 13. And I think we have a great opportunity as coaches to, to take a stand and say, no, we're going to give this game back to our kids. And what I'm trying to do through my work in the Change the Game Project, and hopefully you guys will join me in this mission, is make people recognize that, that by giving the game back to kids and introducing these child values and taking out the adult values, we're going to be able to, to have kids who play longer and play better and, and play and become soccer players for life and, and future coaches. And it's going to allow the ones who have the genetic potential and the talent in coaching to rise to the top. But more importantly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a generation of, of active kids. So I hope you'll take this information. I hope you'll take it back to your teams. And, and I hope you'll continue the conversation through NSCA uh, club standards, that that this is really the next step in in raising high performing athletes. So thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, I haven't seen any yet. But please type them in. And David, if you have one, I'll answer yours too. Great. Um, thanks, John. Um, I'd like to use a quote from one of our participants, Andrew, who said, "Every parent and coach should watch this," and I couldn't uh, agree more. Um, fabulous presentation, and this will be available now, um, hopefully if it's recorded, for everybody to take this off YouTube and put it on their website. And um, <clears throat> one of the follow-ups to this will be an email over the next uh, 24, 48 hours that will include a link to John's website, um, a link to where you can um, inquire about purchasing his fabulous book, and also where you can start engaging with John directly through our LinkedIn group on NFCAA um, or NFCAA group on LinkedIn. So uh, thanks, John. Let's go to a couple of promotions. First of all, um, 
this series, um, we are supported by Soccer Coach Weekly, and if you would like to get a copy of Play Like Manchester United, um, this is uh, used to be ten pounds. Now it's only about one pound fifty. But uh, this magazine now is available for anybody who has joined the webinar series, and you'll get an email for that effect. Um, also. Um, you, as I said, you will get this uh, email with the link to the recorded webinar. You'll have the opportunity to join our LinkedIn group. Um, and if you're interested in participating in some of the special topics diplomas that we're delivering through webinar, there'll be a link for that as well. So let's take um, some questions. And they're coming in fast and furious now, so we won't get a chance for everyone. But those questions that you do ask, we will post on LinkedIn and ask John to respond to them over the course of the next few days. So first one from Clark, he asked the question, with regard to early specialization, if parents are worried about um, the, um, the window of opportunity, how do you counter that argument? Uh, that's a great question, Clark. Um, what, what I say is this, that soccer is definitely a sport where early introduction is key. So you, you'll, you never hear, you know, you hear of NFL guys who didn't play football until they're 17 years old, and then they're playing in the NFL. It's not going to happen in soccer. We all know that. We know, all know that they have to develop these, these basic skills early on. But what happened a couple of years ago with the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell was that they, they, they introduced this myth of 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. That was a musical thing. That was a chess thing. It's not a sports thing. And in sports, there are actually what, what the science shows now is that different sports, by playing different sports, you are, you are helping to accumulate your hours. So you don't have to do 10,000 sports specific hours. Free play is an important part of it. And we've lost free play in this country. People say to me all the time, hey, you know, Lionel Messi, all he did was soccer. Ronaldo, he played soccer. But those guys grew up playing. They played for hours a day on the street. And, and there is psychological and physical components of free play that actually help to develop better all-around athletes. In our country here, there's some great crossover sports that um, help develop better soccer players as well. And when you play these crossover sports, things like basketball, things like that, they, they not only develop better agility, balance, coordination, the, the physical parts, the science also shows that kids who play these multiple sports that are similar to their main sport develop better pattern recognition and better creativity in their main sport. They, they get hurt less, and they burn out a lot less. So I, I think, Clark, you face an issue and there's different parts. I, I live in Bend, Oregon, and we have tons of families move here from California because they're just like, you know what, I don't want my eight-year-old just to play soccer, but that's the path we feel like we have to do here. And so what I say is tell them to, you know, here's the science. Like I said on my website, I, I've just done two articles on this. One went up today, one went up two weeks ago. This is what the science says. And so are you willing to roll the dice on your kid by saying, we're only going for the software thing here at eight years old? What are you willing to do at 12 or 13 when your son or your daughter says, you know what, I'm done. I don't want to play anymore. Wouldn't you rather let them experience a lot of different sports, find their passion, the one that they really love, and then pursue that later on when, when it really, really matters? So so it, it's a hard thing to do, I, I, and I just think you just put the science in front of them and say, this is what the science says, and, and it's not conclusive yet, but this is, this is the path that's going down that for a sport where you reach your peak in your 20s, like soccer, being in the introductory phase, you know, up to uh, age 10, playing multiple sports is, is actually a beneficial thing. Let's take a couple more. Um, one from Julian. He asks, uh, do you have any advice on how to coach a player with a fixed mindset to become a player with a growth mindset? Great question. Um, yes. Focus, Julian, focus on their effort. Now, try to get away from saying, you know, great play and talk about great effort. Don't say you're an excellent player. You're, do that. So you have to turn your, your praise to an effort process-based 
phrase. And, and I recommend uh, Dr. Carol Dweck's book. It's called Mindset. I think every teacher, I think every coach, I think every parent should read this book. I know for my kids, I, when my son was young and he'd hand me artwork, and I'd read this book, instead of saying, wow, great picture, I started saying, wow, you must have worked really hard on that. And sure enough, a month or two later, my son started saying, hey, Dad, look at this picture. Look how hard I worked on it. And so just those simple words of praise turn the focus on, on the process. And I think talk to that player's parent, parents and, and, and ask them, in school, are they like this as well? Because sometimes there, there are very growth mindset in school and fixed mindset in sports. So the first thing is recognizing it, then helping them to recognize it, and then helping their parents and you to, to praise effort, and, and that's how you start changing the mindset. Um, <clears throat> that's a good segue. Um, you may may mention of how do you recognize it. Nathan asked that question. How do you recognize a growth m mindset with younger children? Uh, well, I'd say more how do you recognize a fixed mindset is, is kids who, when you try to coach them, they, they, they give you an answer back. When you say, hey, think about this, and they say, well, I wanted to do that, or, well, this is, this is what I was doing. Um, so just look at the kids who respond to coaching and do the things that you ask them to do, and then look at the kid who, when you try to coach them, either keep doing the same thing or start playing bad and putting badly and putting their head down because you're, because you're trying to make them better, and all they're hearing is, well, you're not good, and in their mind, I'm good or I'm not good. So, so be very cognizant of the words you use and be very cognizant of how players react to those words. And like I said, I mean, read that book and you will see it right away. I mean, I, I, it was like I had two different teams in front of me all of a sudden when I was able to recognize who had what and then meet with them and meet with their parents and say, this is what I'm seeing in you from sports. This is what I'm trying to get out of you. Let's work.